How are you, man? I'm Gil Roth, and you're listening to a bonus episode of my Virtual Memory Show podcast. This is a COVID check-in episode where I record with a past guest of the Virtual Memory Show to find out how they're holding up during the pandemic. As far as how I'm doing, it's uh, not a great start to the week. I um, woke up from a, a weird dream about traveling somewhere with my father. And the airline lost the bag that had my car key. So we were going to have to get a cab or an Uber or something from an airport. I don't think it was Newark. I, I think LaGuardia back to, to northern New Jersey. God knows how you want to interpret that. But the anxiety and overall unsettledness uh, meant I was up at 4 a.m. So you get this episode a little early today. The... um. The weekend brought some bad news in general. The uh, great cartoonist Richard Sala was found dead on Saturday. I haven't heard any more about what happened, so no idea if it was directly COVID-related or another health issue that whatever whatever happened, he's dead. And I adored his really creepy comics for about 30 years now. So I'm awfully sad that he's he's gone. We corresponded uh, a little. I'd, I'd pitched him on recording a podcast a few years ago when I had a San Francisco trip planned, but he wrote this lengthy apologetic message to decline due to his anxiety about interviews and live, well, recorded interviews and saying the wrong thing. I thought about trying to allay some of those concerns, but so much of his, his comics were built in anxiety and trepidation that I figured, you know, I might sort of break something if I did that. So I spent yesterday that day off that I'm now taking every week um, going through some old Richard Sala anxiety-driven horror comics. On Sunday night, um, I checked out an old girlfriend's running blog, don't judge, because I was wondering whether she was keeping up with distance running during this whole situation and whether there was anything from that I could apply to my own running. And the blog led off with this long day by day from March uh, about taking care of her father in upstate New York and how she was running, chronicling her runs each day. Um, and then one day led to the, his hospitalization and then the diagnosis of COVID and then his death from kidney complications by the end of that month. And she never saw him again after after he went in. And she kept writing about her, her running every day during that, that collected post, which I totally understand. And after I sent her a, a sympathy note, I mean, God knows if she's going to respond. It, it doesn't matter. We dated like 20 years ago. Um, never stayed in touch for obvious reasons. But it occurred to me that for whatever solace these podcasts provide and whatever firsthand experience the guests offer, the ones who've gone through COVID and come out the other side, like this weekend's one with uh, Sato Muhalyan, I haven't spoken to anyone who has lost a loved one to it and talked about that experience. And I don't know if I will for a whole variety of reasons, like decorum and and the taboo of facing death, even in reflection. I lost a cousin of mine a couple of weeks ago. We weren't super close, but she's one of the only relatives I have in North America. Um, she had been in a, a home with Alzheimer's for a while, and after the fact, the nursing home mentioned to her husband that, yeah, it was, it was COVID, but she was already in hospice. <sighs> so she's gone, but it's a little different because she was already gone and because I didn't know her that well or hadn't seen her in a long time. And, and well, I hope I don't lose anyone else. Um, and if you have lost someone and you do want to talk about it, I guess I'm here. Um, let me know. Anyway, in sympathy with my old girlfriend, whose name I will keep anonymous here, I will tell you that I ran 
10 and a half miles on Saturday uh, by coming up with a sort of reverse course of how I normally run so I wouldn't get tied into the routine of how I ran under normal circumstances and blah, blah, blah. And I'm planning on getting out for four or five miles through the neighborhood right after I post this episode. So with all that out of the way, today's guest is supernatural horror author and game writer Cassandra Kaw. Uh, Cassandra checks in from Montreal and, um, <laughs> and speaking of death, uh, we recorded in January uh, in Jersey City, the morning I drove up to New Haven for Harold Bloom's memorial. Um, it was connected to her and Richard Kadri having a, uh, a joint reading at the KGB bar with Ellen Datlow's Fantastic Fiction series. So that's how we connected. But since then, we've stayed in touch through Twitter. And I was interested in seeing how she's making her way th during the pandemic for a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, if you listen to our previous conversation, she's this globe hopping nomad who has to shelter in place. And she's a writer who has to adjust to, to new realities of, of writing and book promotion. And, and she's in the gaming world where virtual presence is a way of life and relationships, you're accustomed to relationships that aren't in person, I guess. And she's just a bunch younger than me, and that likely provides its own framework for, for processing this whole shebang. Anyway, I'll give more information about Cassandra's work at the end of the episode, but as caveats go, not a ton. Her audio was actually pretty good, although there's some echo here and there. Now here's me and Cassandra. How are you dealing? How are, uh, how are you doing? I'm all right. I... Genuinely, I'm starting to go a little bit crazy because I have no access to the gym. I don't think I realize how important my weightlifting schedule was to me. Mm. Body weight exercises are great, but they're not quite the same. Is it for the just for the equipment side of the gym, or is there a you know the 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 people, the the environment, etc., or is it really just you know I need this sort of equipment to do my thing? Yeah, that sort of equipment. Uh, I feel like my landlord would have issues if I got all the things necessary to do a deadlift in the apartment. There will likely be a hole in his ceiling. Yeah. So <laughs> We hear enough about weird plumbing problems anyway with people's roofs collapsing and all that shit. Yes. But, but, but when we met a couple of months ago, you know, you, you kind of described a life in transit. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, beyond just the, the gym side of things, just being in a single place this long, you know, is that wearing on you also, or is it something you're you're growing more accustomed to and just wish you could lift more stuff? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a complicated question. Uh, I'm good I've, with those. I've realized <laughs> you are. I've realized that I tend towards being very claustrophobic in general and Watching the borders close and the restrictions go up, well, it wasn't really good for my mental health as a former nomad. I might not want to leave for any particular reasons, but if I hear the locks coming on, I want to get out. Oh, when when this began in like mid March, <laughs> when things were starting to get bad, the running group I was with, I, I, I you, well, until a week into this, when we decided social distancing was necessary, mm -hmm. one of the older guys, about seventy, uh, he said to me, "He's like, dude, I haven't been to the movies in five years, and now I want to go to a movie theater because they just told us all the movie theaters are closed." It, you know that that mentality yes. is like, mm -hmm. yeah, that that sense of I didn't want to, but now that you told me I can't, you know, I really need to. <laughs> Have you have you committed any any horrible violations you don't want to uh you know anybody to hear but you can tell me on the podcast in terms of quarantine <laughs> or or going out to places or have you been pretty uh pretty good about it? I've actually been pretty good about it. I really wish I wasn't. And it's entirely possible at some point I might just go running screaming towards the bar right there, but I feel very strongly about protecting other people's health. So even yeah. when friends are like you know, it's okay, kind of, to interact with, like, one or two other people. I'm like, I, I can't deal with the risk. Yeah, same here. It's me and my wife and my dog. I don't see anybody else in person. The closest I came was uh, taking my dog out at night and discovering there were two young people uh, at the house next door to mine in the, the dark. I had to 
bring the dog in, got my flashlight phone out, went over there to see what was going on. It was basically the, the granddaughter of the owner of the house who had just moved away and the kid just wanted to hang out somewhere. And I walked back to the house and realized that's the closest thing to like in-person social interaction I've had <laughs> since the middle of March. You know? how, so, has, yeah. how has that felt for you? It's weird. Um, you know, I, I deal with people all the time. I'm, I'm doing calls, doing this show daily mm -hmm. helps in terms of, of conversation. But, but it was like the, the episode I posted this morning, we talked about it. It, it was a person who plays in uh, 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 orchestras and chamber music and all this. And, you know, it's a difference between feeling and information like we get across the information this way, but sitting with you on at, at in the murder hotel back in uh, <laughs> Jersey City, it's a different vibe. It's it's you know a, a different sort of thing. So, yeah, that that's lacking. We do the best approximation we can, and we also all have to grok the fact that you know everybody's in this yeah. the same yeah. way. You know, nobody has it easy right now. No, and I'm the news makes me worried constantly all the countries, all the cities trying to lift up restrictions and health professionals kind of pointing to the Spanish flu and going, are we really sure we're going to do this? You do know historically this has just resulted in a second more deadly outbreak, right? Yeah. And yet the government and, keeps on going. Right. And you've got a background in, you know, horror and, mm -hmm. and you know, ugly, ugly death. So, you know, I'm sure this is the sort of thing that, that you know, would sound like second nature to you, but actually fills you with dread and, and even more anxiety. I'm right it about that, right? It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it really does. And I think I read somewhere, er, oh God, years and years ago about how horror writers are actually a bunch of scaredy cats at heart. We just yeah. are very good at describing exactly why we're terrified. <laughs> You're trying to externalize it to, mm -hmm. you know, share it with other people. Um, you talk a little, I, I thought you'd mentioned, well, when we recorded, uh, you had a couple of projects that you couldn't announce, announce. Are mm -hmm. things progressed enough that you can announce things on the yes. off chance somebody's listening? Uh, Tell me what you got going. <laughs> I have a new book coming out next month. It is a tie-in novella for the Vampire the Masquerade game. That is, I don't actually recall the release date, but that is coming out next month. It features a tech bro who will have every single one of his needs and requirements as a human being very quietly torn away from him and his entire humanity subliminated by larger, more ancient forces. So I think people will enjoy that. That was very cathartic. It was written partially to amuse a friend of mine who had a very poor run-in with a very horrible human being. So... That's coming out next month. Uh, Nothing But Blackened Teeth, my Haunted House novella, is finally, officially, officially announced. We are all very still puzzled about yeah. all of this because the trajectory... timeline? Yeah, yes, the, tra yeah. the trajectory was really weird. Ordinarily, there is the whole the deal assigned, things are done, the marketing department prepares you know, the whole schedule and stuff, but Ellen Datlow being Ellen Datlow, who I'm really grateful, was very excited about it, went up, I think, to the publisher and asked permission to talk about the book. So the book has been discussed about for a long time now, but also we weren't really supposed to talk about it for six months. Understood. My, my life is a non-disclosure agreement, so I <laughs> yes. always err on the side of not saying stuff. I, I get you. <laughs> it is very weird when those kind of do not say something things uh, just doesn't quite work out. My brain cannot quite process that. And I think in July, uh, there might be one more announcement, but I cannot tell you from which of all the freelancing things and day job things that I do it is from. But July, we'll have another fun announcement. And are you planning sort of virtual book tours or anything for for the stuff you've got coming along? Those, are, are you figuring out ways to do publicity while you're you're trapped in the apartment? I guess um, a little bit, but honestly, I'm more concerned about creating opportunities for other people. I have a stable yep. enough day job. I have a large enough following that I'm not entirely concerned, and will happily do what the marketing departments require of me but I'd like to be able to at least use some of my resources to set up more opportunity for people who rely on writing entirely 
as you know their basic income. Gotcha. Can you talk a little about what you're doing along those lines? Uh, I, mean, I saw some retweets and things that you did uh, of mm -hmm. you know writers, but you know if you could talk a little about what you try to do to, to help. Be cool. um, so while I was working as a business developer for a small game publisher, I got to know a number of people who work uh, Twitch streamers rather. And a bunch of them are huge readers. They have fairly significant followings. Um, the streams see anywhere between 50 to 300 people at any given moment. And I'm trying to organize it so that the streamers can host readings. Mm -hmm. And that would offer um, writers a slightly bigger you know, audience than your traditional reading, which I guess kind of usually caps at about 50 people. You cannot stuff 300 people into your, you know, average reading. Unless you got Richard Cadry at the KGB. I'm just kidding. Oh, come on. <laughs> yes, but even then, there was only so much space in KGB. Oh, you and your fire hazards. Yeah. <laughs> it was fairly claustrophobic, and I genuinely admire Richard's ability to seamlessly talk to every fan that shows up. Me and my cousin were just busy eating the jelly beans someone tried to give him. Nice. And you never know what's going to be in those. So, um, but how's the, the, the Twitch notion going in terms of, of doing readings that way? Is it the sort of thing that the, the audience would be into? Like, is, is it fiction or writing that, you know, kind of pertains to their, their area of interest? Or is it kind of it, the, hey, you should check this out and you don't know you like it, but you're going to like it. It is very much, hey, you should check this out because you follow the streamer, you're willing to subscribe to them um, every month. You trust their tastes in games, so why not branch out a little bit and see what they enjoy in books? We've done two of these events reasonably successfully, and I'm kind of liking how there's the opportunity for... Um, viewers to actively interact with the readers but through the curation of the twitch streamer who you know is constantly monitoring the check paying attention to what kind of questions are coming out and choosing the best moment to talk to the readers so there's no real disruption there is a host that does this eight hours a day every single day of the week Jeez. this whole world to me is alien i don't mean it in a derogatory way it's just it's a whole culture. I don't even want to say subculture because it's so huge. It's a whole culture I, I've stayed away from because I'm afraid I'll get completely sucked into it. <laughs> um, but but I'm glad it's working to, to good ends like this. So that's that's a positive. It, it Speaking really, of, oh, oh, oh go on. I was going to no, say no, it really, really is a fascinating um, subculture. I recall going to a convention once and a bunch of streamers were testing out one of the games that uh, my company was had created, well, published. And they held just running commentary with no one in sight, just perfect polished conversation for about 40 minutes to absolutely no one. And I just stood there going, huh, on one hand, this is incredibly <laughs> strange, but I absolutely understand why this is happening. Yeah, I, I get the I get the principles behind it. Like, I, I'm just afraid of immersing myself into it and, and never coming back out. But uh yeah. Uh, and oh, let me ask that with, with your career on the gaming side, my job is completely secure because I represent pharmaceutical manufacturers in Washington and elsewhere, and they're very much in demand. Gaming is solid while everybody is stuck at home with their, their platforms, as far as you can tell? It's definitely incredibly solid, at least with Ubisoft. The company came down hard on the necessities of quarantine, they figured out structures, they figure out new systems to make sure that everyone's capable of doing the uh, work at home. Uh, we have internal endeavors that look towards maintaining the mental health of the employees, um, our managers check in constantly. So far, it looks sustainable. And everything seems to be good. I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen as Montreal is going to slowly reopen slightly too soon for my personal liking. And I'm worried how, if... How, hmm? I was going to say, how has the city been? You know, I've only done Montreal once. I don't know the, the city that well, but what's the what's, what has been the vibe there, notwithstanding the you know opening too soon? 
quiet, restrained、um, people are in general incredibly respectful of the rules that have been set by the government. But as summer rolls in, I can tell there are a lot of folks going. Yeah, it can't be that bad. I'm in my twenties. I'm in my thirties. I'll be able to survive this. And I'm seeing slightly larger pockets of people collecting in the parks. And well, obviously, that's a source of immense worry. Yeah, yeah. I, I still marvel over people who see this as a binary of I either die or I'm perfectly fine, and don't understand that there's a huge range of complications in between, regardless、yeah. of how old you are.、Mm-hmm. Much less the everybody else you could infect and and kill.、Um, Yeah, it, it's kind of well, you know. I'm I'm this、mm-hmm. guy who is hiding away from all human contact, as I said. So I'm I'm a, an exception in that case. But、um, when it comes to gaming, also、uh, this whole Animal Crossing thing. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> Yes. So far, everybody, you know, most everybody I talk to is just on about Tiger King,、um, and I, I just don't know anybody who's on the gaming side of stuff. But、uh, apparently, Animal Crossing has taken over the world.、Um, I don't. I, I had to read a piece on Slate about it a couple of days ago to understand like the basic <laughs> principles of it, because I was a Sims guy back in the、mm-hmm. late '90s, early aughts, and I thought, oh, maybe this is like, nah, this is much weirder than Sims. I have no goddamn idea. So. Does it? How does it work? And is it something that's that's a, a not? I don't want to say productive, but a fun way to to pass the time. Or do you feel like you're you know an addict? You know, basically waiting for another little dopamine hit of something. Or do, are those recon- irreconcilable in any way? It's. I think it depends on who you're talking to. I've seen some people on my timeline get really, really into Animal Crossing in a way that makes me go, "How many hours are you spending on this a week?" <laughs> But it feels like therapy for me. One of the things that is incredibly interesting about Animal Crossing is that it deviates from、um, one golden rule in games. It feels like. Um, gamers want to get their fix. Gamers want to get whatever they want as quickly as possible, and you should be able to cater to it.、Um, pa- pa- partially to market it more easily, partially keep people happy. But Animal Crossing kind of goes, no,、uh, this is going to happen in two days, and you shall wait whether you like it or not. And in the beginning, that really bugged me because I'm so used to the instant gratification side of video games. Yeah, but it offers a strange kind of structure. You cannot do too many things in a game at any given time, unless you try really hard. Yeah, and so having that cycle and having the ability to visit your friends, have your friends visit you, it offers a weird, slightly black mirror, but very fucking cute version of human interaction. Nice. Uh, again, I I got a little of that from reading about it. I'm like, I don't get how that works, but I'm glad you know it seems to be in a non harmful way. You know, get getting people to to hang and chill. Did you read, by the way, Eighty、uh, Eight Names yet? The the new novel by Matt Ruff. I have not. I really have to get、uh, to it. I have okay, unfortunately my reading list is huge. That's my next question, of course. But but yeah, with with Eighty Eight Names, it's about a Sherpa.、Uh, you know, the guys who are Taking people along on on the games so that they can jack them up to to really high levels and all、mm-hmm. this and you know try to、uh, escape the terms of use basically、yeah. and or、mm-hmm. the, the end user agreement. So、um, so I'm glad that that Animal Crossing kind of short circuits all that and makes you wait. It, it's like I guess some of those、um, not Netflix but other、uh, of the streaming networks that are going back to the you know what you're getting one episode a week. You know, we're we're going to go back to that that model, and you don't get to watch twelve episodes in the span of you know an evening. You have to sit and wait, and or wait for the whole thing to finish before you can you can dive in. Yeah. That uh, yeah, it's a weird thing that that idea of kind of returning to slowing things down. I think it's kind、um, of healthy for our current environment. Really,、um, we're all constantly buffeted by everyone's anxiety and fear and need to be outside right the hell now. And systems like that kind of encourage us to think, even subconsciously, that if we wait, good things will happen. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a good a、uh, good principle. I,、mm-hmm. I've you know figured out a, a routine for how I handle each day at this point, but、uh, it, it can start to feel like it's going off the rails. And even that involves you know just delaying certain things and and you know building in buffer time for stuff.、Mm-hmm. But but what are you reading? What's the、uh, and were you able to? 
get into reading when this began or did it take you a while to, to kind of gain focus? Um, no, I, reading was not affected at all by this. And right now I'm going through Mongrels again. Oh, the Stephen Graham Jones? <sighs> yes, I love that book so much and I continue to be so upset at his sparse poetry and his careful violence in that book. Still don't know how he does it. I, I've been rereading their book once every three months or so and just getting endlessly frustrated at how good it is. Well, I've, I've got it here on my shelf. I'll, I'll pull it down, especially now that I don't have to worry about doing in-person shows. I can I can tell myself it's for a future remote podcast. So, mm -hmm. you know, I just have to convince him of that, too. <laughs> <laughs> and what else has been on the uh, on the list or in the stack of books next to the bed or however you... Um, let's see. I'm reading the third Arusha book from the Rick Rodian Presents series. It is kind of like Percy Jack. Well, the whole endeavor, I'm not sure you're familiar with it, is I think somebody asked Rick Rodian, are you going to ever write about uh, different cultures? Because he wrote books based on Greek mythology and stuff like that. And Rick Rodian kind of went, you know what? I am a white man. I am not going to do that, but I am a white man. With influence, therefore, we set up an imprint that allows people from the correct backgrounds to tell their stories. And all of the books from there have been excellent. Carlos Hernandez, uh, Saul and Gabby, Break the Universe and Fix the Universe books are fantastic. And I love them to tiny, tiny, tiny bits. Hmm. But yeah, right now I'm going through the Arusha book, uh, the third Arushar book, which looks at um, Indian mythology and explores um, the Pandava myth, if the Pandava brothers were reincarnated into five 10-year-old girls. Interesting. Okay. It's good. I, I will hit, I'll hit you up after this for a, <laughs> a, a, a just an email list with a, a couple of names like that. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Uh, were there shows or festivals you were really hoping to go to this year? By the way, the, the, I know everything's been canceled, but yes. is there anything that you really are bummed out that you don't get to, to go to? God, yes. Uh, the mural festival in Montreal, I've spent an entire year looking forward to it. When I moved to Montreal, nobody told me that the city once a year gives artists the liberty to paint entire walls with whatever wow. the hell they want. And we're talking about like giant three, four story walls here. It's mm -hmm. gorgeous and apparently happens every year. The city allocates different spaces to artists. They retain it and it's beautiful. And I remember spending a lot of last year just kind of idly wandering around the city trying to see if I could find a new piece of art that I hadn't seen or something that was in progress. And knowing that's not going to happen this year kind of breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember our one trip to Montreal, Amy took this beautiful photo of a, a sort of alleyway that had this this mural on all the two walls plus ceiling of it that was just absolutely mind blowing. I have no idea if it was part of that. I didn't know was this, it black this and festival white? existed. Yeah, yeah. I think I yeah. know what which one you're talking about. Yeah, I'll have, I'll have to get the picture from her and mm. send that over to you just in case because uh, yeah, it's one that she just we're walking by and she just suddenly stopped and I was still walking to the corner. So <laughs> no, I, I, I need to figure out a picture of this. So awesome. Now, are you um? Do you find yourself more in touch with? Are you talking to people more than you had been prior to this? Are you reaching out or are people reaching out to you to just kind of stay in contact? People are reaching. People are reaching out a lot more. Um, some of friends that are incredibly welcomed and I'm getting weirder and weirder messages from strangers uh -huh. who I feel are a little bit inspired, you know, by the pandemic to take very odd shots. <laughs> to put it as delicately as I can. I might have to close. The, the, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say the internet turns everything into um, that, basically. Yes. Yeah. Um, but Would I find myself put... retreating a little bit more. I've always been somewhat hermit-like, and now my life is definitely very much revolving around exercise, work, cooking, exercise, a lot of exercise. Um, I am a border collie that really needs her gym. <laughs> yeah. Do you uh, do, do you have everything broken out into a, a routine at this point? Not just the exercise, but like the structure of the day or... Do you have some flexibility or do you find yourself falling into kind of patterns as to, to how you do stuff? 
it's definitely a strict schedule at this point of my life. Um, yeah. I think it, it's also just kind of necessary. Otherwise, the days kind of just blur together because all I'm seeing is myself and, you know, the apartment. Hmm. Yeah. Do you do video chat with friends or anything? Are there any besides, you know, phone stuff like this? Um, you know, does anyone know what you look like right now? I guess. Is, uh... <laughs> <laughs> the internet knows what I look like. There are, still, there are still pictures on my Twitter, but I do occasional uh, video chats. I have... A regular weekday thing with a bunch of colleagues from work where we all hit up weirdly comforting baking shows on Netflix party. Nice. Yeah, that's that's another phenomenon that, you know, I, I appreciate it exists. I don't have anyone I'm, I'm friends with enough to watch a movie together with, but I get the, the Netflix party idea. I'm like, yeah, that's that's going to, as best we can, try to replicate mm -hmm. what it's like to just hang out with people. But yes. Oh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> family okay or is that uh, an off limits -y sort of question to ask to begin with I, I um, I'm deeply estranged from my family don't mind discussing it but I'm just going to leave just it as I yeah. try my best to have nothing to do with them for various reasons uh, I, I grew up in tropical Malaysia the situation was so bad I basically ran off into Antarctica <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just wasn't sure with with you know the infection situation out there if it's something you're even kept apprised of or that was another part of your your life that's no longer you know pertinent. Mm -hmm. Yes, I get you. Big reading project or anything you really want to get to as long as you have all this time on your hands and no social interaction in person. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think I might go out and acquire a bunch of new seeds. I have enough to grow some bonsai, but I think I'm going to try starting up either my bee garden or my vegetable garden. Uh, the plants were sort of there before, but it got postponed by the fact that on top of the pandemic and all the governments exploding, we had to get a polar vortex. Snow yeah. in May is deeply offensive. Oh yeah, we we just had it cold uh, up here in northern New Jersey or down here in northern New Jersey. Uh, it was about thirty or so when I got up this morning, uh, Fahrenheit. But uh, yeah, I saw you guys, even my friends in upstate New York, um, just posting pictures of snow. I'm like, okay, next yep. is hot hail. I, I don't know if you ever saw the Flash Gordon movie from 1980, no. uh, where Ming the Merciless. Yeah, feel free to stream that one because it's campy but entertaining. Mm -hmm. uh, Ming, Ming the Merciless starts fucking with planet Earth. Um, and he's got a whole panel of, of buttons of things he's sending down on the planet. And one of them is hot hail. Oh, so, yeah, <laughs> before he, he blows up the Earth, he's going to mess with the things first. And Flash Gordon ends up, uh, you know, in space and defeating him. It's one of Max von Sydow's greatest roles. So, um, well, okay, maybe not one of his greatest, but it's one of the great ones for me. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, given the trajectory of 2020, if hot hail started happening, I'd, at this point, I would just shrug. You this know, just yeah, seems hard on course for 2020 at this point. Yeah, is this um, is this whole experience fueling anything you're writing at this point, or are you still in the? Are you processing what's going on in a way that doesn't reflect isn't reflected in in what you're working on yet? It is definitely propelling my writing, but in a way that I wasn't really expecting. Yeah. Instead of horror, I seem to be drifting towards trying to write something bright and happy because I don't keep wanting to add to the miserable zeitgeist. I <laughs> would like to give people more things to escape. Like reality is bad enough. They don't have to be even more miserable. I get you. Yeah. One of my guests who was actually suffering from COVID had been working on a pandemic novel for like a year or two before this. And after she survived, she came back with, you know, I think I'm going to give it a much more upbeat ending than the original mm -hmm. version I had. I, I think we need something that's a little less apocalyptic than our day-to-day -day lives. Yes. So. <sighs> and a game you're you're willing to invest tons of hours in if you've got the the time while we're all locked in? Not not really. It, the, um, I play Animal Crossing. There is a card game called Slate Aspire that I mess around with a lot. Um, I play something called RimWorld, a colony builder mm. with my cousin. But aside from that, I'm not really the kind of person who's really happy with the idea of being unproductive for hours. It just kind of eats at me. Understood. You could pretend it's research, but yeah, I, I get where <laughs> you're coming from. And last question, mm -hmm. under what condition would you feel like it's safe to, to go back to the gym? <sighs> 
I don't know. I am definitely leaning towards I am going to stick my head in there at least the moment it opens again. Because, and I mean this with all love for people in the games industry, there are not that many people who go to the gym. It's just a bunch of us gym rats, so I don't feel too yeah. bad. The last time I went to the gym, uh, gym before we all closed down, there was six or seven people just pointedly glaring at each other until the other just kind of <laughs> spritzes everything down. So... Yeah. It should be okay. It might be okay. I'm hoping you'll be okay because there is only so much I can take before I go a little bit nuts. You're already a little bit nuts, but I, I love am. you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for coming on. I, I hope we can meet up in person again. Uh, not in a murder hotel, but uh, no, never yeah. in a murder hotel again. Never. God, no. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was something. Uh, I was supposed to be in Toronto this weekend. In fact, it's the, the annual Toronto Comic Arts Festival for my regular Get Out of America during Mother's Day weekend. Uh, um, yeah, well, we got a complicated relationship too. Mm -hmm. But but anyway, Montreal someday or maybe down here in New York, I, I hope we can get together again. I hope so too. We'll see if the borders to America ever open again. And that was Cassandra Kaw. Her books include series like Food of the Gods and Hammers on Bone. Uh, you should check out her website, CassandraCaw.net, to see her fiction, poetry, essays, interviews, gaming articles, and reviews, and, and more. And that's C-A-S-S-A-N-D-R-A-K-H-A-W.net. She's on Twitter and Instagram as Cass Caw, which is C A S S K H A W. Um, in June, her horror novella will be part of the collection Walk Among Us. Uh, the collection has three novellas set in the world of Vampire the Masquerade, a tabletop RPG. And as mentioned, she's got other work coming soon, too. Oh, and she's got a per story Patreon at patreon.com slash Cassandra Kaw and is on Kofi at ko-fi.com slash Cass Kaw. I'll have links to all those in the show notes page for this episode. And we'll be back tomorrow with another COVID check-in. I recorded three over the weekend, so we're set through Wednesday. Um, if you want to send me a little update to read on the air or have something you want to share with listeners... Let me know and we'll set something up. I'm at groth18, G-R-O-T-H-1-8 at gmail.com. You can find my contact info at our websites, vmspod.com and chimeraobscura.com slash vm. And you can find a link to the COVID-19 sessions at both sites with all of these daily episodes. You can also just subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show via iTunes, Spotify, or whatever podcatcher you like. You can grab the RSS feed from chimeraobscura.com slash VM. And that way, you'll get every episode, including the archive of 370 or so in-person ones. Now, I used to record in person in the before time, but... Now that we're all social distancing, I have to use Zencaster.com to record remotely. If you're interested in it, it is spelled Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R, so no final E. There's a free hobby level as well as a pro level that's 20 bucks a month. That's what I use so I can get higher quality audio recordings when we finish up. But my Patreon supporters more than cover the expenses for this show, uh, which is down to uh, web hosting for 20 bucks a month and Zencaster, since all my equipment is basically amortized. Um, what I'm saying is I'm not spending money anymore on parking, tolls, subway trips, coffee, etc. for in-person shows. I don't need your money. I've got a day job that takes care of me pretty well. If you can spare anything, go find the Patreons, Kickstarters, GoFundMes, Indiegogos, coffee, tip jar, whatever, for the artists and writers who you like, and show them some support. There are a lot of people out there in need right now. If you can help, do a little something. If you don't want to donate to people individually, there are plenty of charities like your local food bank and other places that will help people. So do what you can, please. I am Gil Roth. It is Monday, May 11th, 2020, and this was a bonus episode of my Virtual Memory Show podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Keep the conversation going. Stay safe. 
and wash your damn hands.